talk about taking STL files and then slicing them so that they're ready to run in a printer. And the thing you need to know is most of the time you've got your CAD rendering file and it's able to export file types like STLs or objects and STL is a stereo lithography file and then a standard triangle layout or something like that. But what you need to know is you get this weird object and generally I will open the STL file and I'll check it in a program called MeshLab which is opening up to the left. And the nice part about MeshLab is it allows you to look through your object. So sometimes when you see your part, when you're trying to understand what's happening, come here, come on. You can grab the object and rotate it. And then occasionally when you have certain subcomponents like the sprues intersecting your object, you may need to zoom in to understand what is happening at the object. Okay, so you can look internally and find if there are any errors. And sometimes with poorly designed objects, you'll find little components trapped within the core of your object. And so MeshLab is really good for verifying that you have one object and that's just your object. So importing your files is simply a drag and drop. They've got a nice graphical user interface system on here. And one thing you want to be aware of is you need to click the eyeball to look at what you're doing. And then in order to move your part, if you don't want it in a particular location, you can move it to the left or to the right, up or down. And it's generally in millimeters. So you have to figure out how far you want to move your object. If that's too confusing to understand the Cartesian coordinate system, you can always use Control Z or Apple Z to bring it back, or you can manually grab it. And what it'll do is tell you how far you're moving it from its most recent position. You can also rotate your object. If your object is upside down, you can rotate it over the Y plane or the Z plane or the X plane, depending on where it is. But generally you want your part to be placed on the platform and if there's only one part, center is fine. You can also go into the scaling options and select uniform scaling, which allows you to scale your object by percentage. Or you can decide non-uniform scaling where you're scaling one axis to be significantly different. So we'll say 75. And then if you look from the top view, it is now an oblong star. So those are all options, but since we've made the parts exactly as we intend, really the goal is to just import several parts onto the platform. And if you look at the top, you can see that two of the objects are actually intersecting. And if you print that, it's going to try and embed the two objects within one another. So it is generally a good idea to select move and then separate your objects out into different locations. And you can nest them fairly tightly. So if you grab one and then nest the other, that works. If you just want ease of access to see what's happening, you can move them around for whatever makes sense for your build platform. Okay. So we're going to do this orientation just because it's easy to see and easy to understand. And we're going to select each object, and this is important. Just make sure that each object is on the platform. Oftentimes you'll find that an object is slightly above or slightly below the platform, and you want to make sure that if for some reason in the z-axis it's elevated, right? you look at the uh, build from the side, on the very side you'll realize there's nothing holding your part on, and so the printer will just run that toolpath free floating and start extruding material and that will cause your print to fail. So it's always important to make sure all of your parts are on the platform. Okay, put it back. And then look again from the top, make sure that the build platform makes sense for what you have. Now for settings, there's a lot of things you can do. You can select your material type. There's a range of materials. You can also adjust your extruder temperature. Generally, the factory settings are fairly good for um, ready-to-go machines out of the box. Standard infill is appropriate unless you're doing high-resolution detail. 
If you're doing rough parts that are consumables, you can switch to low, and that's just going to change the layer height. So if you go to low, it'll be 0.3 millimeters. If you go to standard, it's 0.1. And if you go to high, it's generally still 0.1. Uh, I adjusted my standard so that it's at 0.1. You can use rafts. That builds a lower base for you to print on. You can use support if you have objects that need overhangs. These three objects were designed to be printable without support because support removal is time consuming and sometimes very frustrating. Generally I'll print these objects with two shells and 8% infill, especially for casting. But any custom settings you want, you can build throughout here. So once you've got your print setting set, you can click OK. And then you can preview what the toolpath looks like. And the funny part is if you've left MakerBot open, it'll think the name of your file type is the last file you had open. So I was test printing another part called the Neural Bracelet. But what I want to do here is show you the way the machine thinks about parts. So it's running these perimeter toolpaths, and if you look closely, it's doing little tiny strokes of infill for the surfaces. There's some diagonal banding as the object moves forward. And then through this tall core sprue, there's a hexagonal infill, and these are where the three hexagons converge, and then a perimeter of circular motion. But you can look at each layer of the toolpath to figure out what your machine is trying to accomplish as it's printing. The object is so thin it's mostly existing of shell. It tells you the estimated print time is about 39 minutes and it's going to take about 2.5 grams of material. Okay. So you can click close or you can click export. You can also click export print file. And again, it's going to go with the last object you had in here, unless you import a new object from scratch. So we're going to name this star for array. And then for tracking purposes, you get a little X3G or an S3G file. Right? This is a G code toolpath. I generally put the information that I have on my print parameters because it's hard to remember. And the shorthand for that is a parenthesis as a shell. So I have two shells and then I'm printing at 8%. So if we're printing at 8% and we want to know that for the next print, if you're running this off of an SD card, it's better if you have a notation to say, I made this part. There are these files attached and there are parameters attached to the part. So then just save the file. And the files are directed to a folder called Q, and that is reserved specifically for 3D printing files. It takes a couple minutes to generate, but an X3G file is just a machine language that tells the robot to drive around in the X, Y, and Z coordinate system to lay down a piece of material in a giant continuous noodle that forms these objects. And then during each increment up in the z-axis, going up or down, right, it will stop extruding material and then it'll start pushing more material out, making another continuous noodle that fuses to the next layer. So once you have your file in Q, generally I'll clean it up by date created. And there is our four star array. And for the MakerBot Replicator 2, it's going to get this information through an SD card. So I'm going to transfer the X3G to the SD card trinkets, and then press eject. 